How many times did you say Tommy Randolph's phone called Mike Miller's phone as given by the state during that time period? 234 times. Over how many days? It's for the entire uh, time period of uh, February 12th, 2008 to May 8th, 2008. Okay. How many calls per day is that? On average, I think I, I remember seeing uh, it could have been five calls, seven calls, three calls. It varied each day. Some days it was more than others, so. 2.7 calls a day sound right? Sure. Is that a lot? I guess it depends. All right, welcome back to Closing Arguments. We are now in week three of the widower murder retrial. Here is 68-year-old defendant Thomas Randolph in court today. He is accused of murdering his sixth wife and a handyman. He allegedly hired that man as a hitman, a hitman that prosecutors say the defendant called more than, as you heard, 200 times in the days and months leading up to the murder. Now, it's important to remember Thomas Randolph was convicted for these same crimes back in 2017 and actually sentenced to death. But ultimately, that conviction was overturned. Nicknamed The Widower, Randolph was the focus of a Dateline series where he infamously demonstrated what he said happened during the shooting. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has more on today's biggest developments. Michael, the lead detective in the widower murder retrial, will retake the stand tomorrow as the prosecution's case in chief is winding down here in Las Vegas. So far, Detective Dean O'Kelly has detailed what, in his estimation, doesn't add up at the crime scene, including the location where Thomas Randolph claimed he shot the alleged intruder as compared to the physical evidence at the scene, and that the mask the intruder was allegedly wearing didn't have any bullet holes, blood, or tissue on it, as would be expected. Mr. Randolph described uh, colliding with Mr. Miller in the doorway and he was wearing the ski mask and that he started shooting at him continuously until he went to the floor in the garage and then he fired uh, an additional one or two rounds uh, into Michael Miller's head. Also on the stand today was a retired police sergeant, Tony Maldonado, who also responded to the scene May 8, 2008, and testified about how carefully first responders processed that crime scene, a point of contention on cross-examination. You ever seen anybody waltz in a crime scene? Yes. Waltz? Well, depending on the crime scene, yes. Okay. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by waltz. He asked the question a bunch of times about whether or not anyone was waltzing through the crime scene. Like, a waltz is a dance, right? It could be, yes. Yeah. You've seen somebody dance in a crime scene? No. I caught up with Maldonado outside the courthouse. It was just a, a, a shooting call um, that uh, the homeowner had come home with his wife after a night out. He went into the house. He saw that his wife had been shot. Um, he ended up retrieving a gun, ended up shooting the suspect. And then we were getting details that he actually knew the suspect. I could see where um, the prosecutor was kind of poking fun at yeah. the defense attorney, you know, but it's just And it's waltzing, just have you ever in your almost 30 years experience been asked if you waltzed through a crime scene? Right, no, I've never been asked that. <laughs> and Michael, the day culminated with the prosecution playing a second interview the defendant did with detectives several weeks after the killings. And tomorrow we do expect the defense case to begin. For now though, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks to Chanley Painter for that report. The think tank is still with us. Let's bring back in criminal defense attorney Al Wunsch III, criminal defense attorney Donnell Crossland, and family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Donnell, I'll start with you this time. Um, despite what we just saw there, a little sort of, I guess they were making light of a word like Waltz. These are excellent attorneys uh, in this case. But I tell you, as we look at the evidence brought out by the state, this time around, they, didn't, they weren't able to bring in evidence of a similar situation many years ago that he was found not guilty of hiring a hitman to kill his wife. So they're relying on a number of other things. One of them, the most important things, are the discrepancies between his story and what showed up in the forensics and what some of the things that he told the detectives. And I submit to you, and I want to know what you think, some of the strongest evidence presented to this jury has been the detectives, and the, they argued this. The defense wanted to keep this out. He allowed all of these detectives to talk about to talk about all the things that they found odd about his story, what made them suspect him as being involved, why things didn't match up. And we all know that officers, they're held in high esteem by juries. I find that to be some of the most important testimony for the state. Your thoughts? 
So uh, I can only tell you that when you do these type of trials, every situation is different. And in this particular case, as you set it up, uh, they are relying heavily on what these officers' uh, uh, experiences has led them to believe. So you got to realize that uh, these officers are, are officers are testifying to what they think should have happened or what the discrepancies are. That leaves a lot of space for defense attorneys to um, to to challenge that. Um, one of the things <laughs> I usually do when when officer gets to understand is I, I ask the really obvious questions. You weren't there, correct? And you're responding to a call that you got, correct? And when you got there, um, you had to speak to people, correct? And again, you weren't there, right? So these aren't, officers aren't eyewitnesses. Um, they're really trying to put things together based on their um, knowledge and on their experience. So, um, you know, it all depends. Like you said, the jury's hold them in high esteem. So when we pick them, uh, jurors, in the beginning, we say you won't hold a police officer to a higher level than you will hold an ordinary person. They say, no, we'll keep, we'll treat them the same. So all you can do is hope that they keep that promise and you can just poke holes at the officer's position as a defense attorney. But ultimately it's gonna be up to the jury to see who they credit um, the most.